So as we continue our jaunt through the um, letter to the Philippians, we now hit the last few verses. Chapter 4, verses 10 through 20, as Paul summarizes his relationship with the Philippians, his thanks to them, and shares his secret to how he gets through life and how we might get through life. So listen to these words for cha from chapter 4, verses 10 through 20 of Philippians. I'm reading through from the NIV version translation. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except only you. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father, be glory forever. Amen and amen. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations on all our hearts be a blessing to you, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Amen. In 2007, I led... Uh, a trip, a mission trip to uh, the Haiti Dominican Republic border. It included the pastor of this church, other adults and youth. And we were there to form a ministry partnership with a local church with the goal, the hope to work together to improve living conditions of Haitian people who were incarcerated in captive areas called bataes and to work for justice for them and ultimately their release. The project was an abject failure, a complete embarrassment. It was an example of painful power imbalance, white church savior complex, horrible communications, cultural unawareness, and poor planning. And it left me and probably everyone trying to separate ourselves from each other. Here's what happened. We had partnered with another um, conference in the United Methodist Church in their ministry and outreach with this partner in the Dominican Republic. We thought that they were raising money to build toilets or to purchase toilets that we were going to then go down and build outhouses to house so that there could be some good sanitation in this essentially labor camp that people lived in as well. Um, we got there and of course the toilets didn't make it. So we were there with our supplies, our materials to build these outhouses, but there were no toilets to put in them. The other churches hadn't raised the money. And then we started, we said, well, let's go ahead and get them built. And then the outhouse, and then the toilets can be delivered and people can then use these outhouses. So we get there, you know, youth and, and adults all ready with our drills and our equipment and all our supplies that we had brought in from, uh, from the Capitol. And of course, every person there, especially the men, were just so excited to participate in 
doing something for their families, for this living area. They wanted to build these things. So there we were with seemingly nothing to do. And instead of blessing them with work that was meaningful, with a gift of these supplies, we said, oh, hmm, can we work alongside you? Can we work with you? Which I thought was a good compromise until all our supplies and all of our tools disappeared because of lack of communication, planning. So then we had to go reclaim all that stuff and cause a lot of pain and discomfort. So then there was a lot of resentment as we went around building these outhouses that at that point, I wondered if anyone was actually going to feel comfortable using. Um, then we find out that we have to have composting toilets, which are far more expensive. And we start writing back, rushing back communications to our congregation and others to try to get some more money so that we can fill up these outhouses. All while there's a lot of resentment going on. And then we find out that there's all this underlying political resentment of us because we were there with a church that was Catholic and there had been many Pentecostal churches that had come in and set up these little mini uh, missions that were offering people all kinds of hope for their lives after death, but doing very little in their re present reality. And then, of course, we didn't realize that these people had no food and we didn't bring any food or plan to bring them any food. So then we had to go and find out ways that we could make sure people in the Batay were being fed. It ended up being a bit of a disaster. Um, and we felt like we were being squeezed left and right for more funds. But we also realized that there was so much need, we couldn't even figure out a way to get our arms around it. And I spent so much time trying to disconnect from them, from all these others that had come and done really bad work in this community that had set up this need-based system where there was no agency, no ability to be individualized, that it was just really hard to separate myself from the bad missiology and the bad theology, the obfuscation going on about who knew what and who did what. It was very hard to find time to care for the team of the kids and the people in the Bataes themselves and our hosts amongst all of this. And I kept thinking, I can't believe that there's these people so different from myself, so different from my culture and community, that there would be a country that it would allow people to be held in cages and denied basic needs like medical care. Like what, who does that and separates them from their families? Like who, what country does that? I couldn't believe there was such a thing. I couldn't believe that there were people that were telling people in dire poverty, so severely impoverished that they only had one cup of beans and rice per week, that God would provide for them if only they believed a little bit more. Who does that? There's no such thing. Who are these people? I couldn't believe that there was a place in this world where people were so sick from an illness going through the camp that was so contagious, everybody was getting it. And that they were told if they didn't show up for work, they wouldn't get paid, even though they had this terrible illness going through the camp. And that if they didn't show up for work, they wouldn't have access to the medical care. Who does that? What country would do such a thing? I couldn't believe that this place had these vigilante security forces randomly breaking into their homes, beating, arresting people just because they were Haitian and not Dominican. I was convinced that I was surrounded by people, others so different from myself. I had no connection with them at all. And then came 2020 and I looked around and I said, that's us.
And I realized that all that othering that I had done, the labeling, the separating, the canceling, that that just led and has led to minimizing, marginalizing, and disregarding, and a lot of missing out. When people, people, regardless of their difference, don't gather together, when we don't have a way or a place to share, when we aren't listening to each other, when we aren't learning from each other, we end up, well, we end up right where we are now, today. Having othered away people from most places around the world and even big chunks of our own country, we now are left wanting. We are left wanting the richness, the resources, the wisdom, and the experiences of those other people who have already wrestled and come to understand how God is experienced in known in the wilderness of their lives. A pandemic, economic disintegration, cultural warfare, and the dissolution of civil society. How good would it be to have sat with them and learned from them all this time as we now encounter that same life? How useful would it be to sit with our siblings in Sierra Leone and understand how they worked through the aftermath of civil war and found God in that work? And with our cousins in South Africa, restructuring access and equity for people, resolving reparations, and understand God's call to justice through it. With our Liberian friends, understanding how they overcame stigmas around health care, like mask wearing, in order to keep people safe during their Ebola crisis. And never mind national crises, what about crossing ecclesiological borders and sit down with denominations from other countries who've wrestled and dealt with ways to work together despite theological differences about human gender and sexuality? The place of this sitting, this gathering, this learning from each other, the gains and the losses, the wins and the mistakes, where we expand our understanding of the force of goodness and love when it doesn't feel good and we aren't loved, that place, this place, is the table. The worldwide table of God's grace and love is the place where we meet each other, not as others, but as ourselves. Paul, in all the guidance he provided to the burgeoning churches that were so different from each other, and even with lots of diversity, even amongst themselves within this, the individual churches, always reminded them that they were one with each other because they were one in Christ and children of God. And in these last few verses of his letter to the Philippians, we hear Paul sharing all that he has learned as he's gathered at these tables and this table. At the beginning of these verses, he's thanking the Philippians for their work supporting his ministry in Thessalonia. He has shared what their work has supported, the sharing of the gospel and the beginning of the church in that place. Across the boundaries of culture, status, language, class, gender, Paul brings together these churches at a table in mutual support and care for each other. And then here in verse 11, he shares his secret, as he says, his secret to life. He says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And here it is. 
I can do all things through him who gives me strength. It's at the table where Paul has experienced this learning of people who are hungry and people who aren't, who have so much, of people who know so many stories and have lived such rich lives. It's at the table that Paul has learned from rich Corinthians, enslaved Galatians, impoverished Jews, Gentiles in Philippia, Roman guards in Rome and Crete, from all of these other people, from them in the sharing of their lives, their hopes, disappointments, meaningful traditions, wisdom teachings, recipes, and all the other parts of what makes up human living. He learned that when they encounter the divine, when they experience God's presence, they know strength and they are given enough of what they need, whatever it is in their particularity to get through their days or at least the next few minutes. Paul describes God being present and strengthening us in our individual moments, in our own experiences of God, but that we share the deep and abiding known gift of God with us, Christ, God with us, Emmanuel, even as we are the body of Christ. I've been really blessed to have the time to do a lot of reading in the last few months, and I have enjoyed uh, my he, Kim Court's beautiful book, Outside the Lines. And she reminds us that in all of our particularities and peculiarities, that we together make up the body of Christ. She writes, we are each an amalgamation of stories and dreams histories and genetics easily affected by lunar cycles, barometric pressure, and sunshine. We're made of stardust, and each of us is, as complica is a complicated mashup of ancestors, cultures, ideologies, and time periods. But we are created in the image of the one who is named, I am who I am. And in that, somehow, we are called together for the miraculous and divine work of creation, of imagining, of redeeming, of calling out, of sanctifying, of living. The table where we remember who we are, Paul reminds us, is for those who have plenty and those in want. For those with lots of hope and those who can't seem to find hope. For those who love the closeness of family during this time of isolation, and for those isolated and alone who hate the loneliness of it. For those juggling the many jobs of work, educating kids and caregiving, and for those who would just love something more to do. For those who desperately miss their church and its windows, and for those who are finding new rituals that bring the meaning, for those who can't stop missing the before time, and for those who can't wait for the after, for those who have done harm, and for those who have been harmed, for all of us, because God calls all of us together to be at the table. Today, we recognize that there are no others at God's table, just us, God's children. And we celebrate today that knowingness, that lack of otherness, as we celebrate World Communion Sunday. Now, I need to share with you that it's the table that redeemed that terrible yet beautiful mission trip to Haiti DR. Back there at the end of our trip, by the way, we did build all those outhouses, but we also found ways to let the people of the community participate in the building of those outhouses and did some deals where they could take our clavels, our nails and screws and fix up their own homes with everything that we had that was available 
if they brought back our power tools. <laughs> And then we also found out, or knew, I guess, that there was a great deal of skilled bas baseball players in the Batay, and we had a great time playing baseball, at least especially Lizzie Burns and some of the others. But then we also learned a lot about what it meant to be together. At one point, we were told that we should bring peanut butter with us in our suitcases because there might not be enough food or we might not like it. And of course we were well fed, well taken care of and our peanut butter just sat in our suitcases. I guess we were planning to bring it back with us. And then Serena Applegren and Lacey Cobbs and some of the other kids realized that we had all this peanut butter and we should do something. We should feed people. They didn't have enough food. And we were running around all over the place trying to scare up some beans and rice for them. And then we found out that our translator had a brother who owned a bakery in the local town. And we went to the bakery and bought every piece of bread in the store and we brought it back. We thought for sure we had would have hundreds and hundreds of uh, rolls and bread that we would feed everybody till they were full and bursting. So we we gathered around this giant piece of wood in under a construction tent and it was everybody. It was the medical team that kind of ignored us because we were just there as church people and they brought some water, fresh water in those big jugs. The Pentecostal preacher came, the conniving ministry organizer came some of the leaders in the batay, the soldiers who were guarding the gates came, all of the annoying Americans that were around trying to help out, the bus driver. We all gathered around this huge piece of wood and we piled all of the bread and rolls on it and all of our peanut butter jars that we brought. And we made sandwiches upon sandwiches upon sandwiches. We just kept making more and more peanut butter sandwiches. And some of the kids from the village where we were staying had come and started joining us in our time in the batets. And so they came and um, we found that there was uh, a commonality between us of knowing terrible 80s praise songs that we sang at the top of our lungs on the bus. So we gathered around the table singing praise songs at the top of our lungs and dancing and laughing. And then we realized that there wasn't going to be enough sandwiches for everybody. So we broke the bread into smaller pieces to make sure everybody at the table was fed and everybody across the batay was fed. We broke the bread, we gave thanks for this wild amalgamation of people, others, now all and one, the body of God, the wild creation called God's people. And we give thanks and we praise God and we shared the bread and the cup. And that's what we do. And that's how we get through life, according to Paul. And we do that now today. Amen.